Two men look through the same cell bars, and one sees mud while the other sees stars. There are two types of people in this world, pessimists and optimists. And I know we all love optimists. Optimists are people we want to share dinner tables with. Optimists are the kind of people we want to be. Pessimists are gloomsters. They're the people who take all the fun out of life. And they're the people who tell us why we can't do things and why we can't change the world, our lives, or our environment. But I think pessimists have had a really tough time, particularly in the last 30 or 40 years, when we have a, basically an agenda in the world of unrelenting positivity. We're encouraged to be happy. We're encouraged to dream. We're encouraged to think that our dreams will always come true. And the bad news is our dreams don't always come true, which is why I want to take us out of the prison that we're all sitting in right now and offer you my secret friend for you to take away today. And my secret friend is pessimism. Of course, to deal with pessimism, the first thing you have to do is really aggressively deal with optimists, because optimists, they're trouble. <laughs> and optimists have been around for as long as people have been around. And you know, one of, one of the, the, the strange things about optimism is, of course, that people largely have to invent what they come up with for the world as it will be in the future. And about 500 years ago, Sir Thomas More came up with his uh, conception of utopia, a place that would be a perfect environment in which to live. And of course, it was a fictional map. Uh, and many people have written uh, fictional accounts of what utopia might be again, uh, or done maps again in the future. But it strikes me as slightly odd that nearly 500 years later, you still have people writing fictional maps of, of, of utopia because utopia doesn't actually exist. Now, this map's pretty busy. It was uh, produced by James Turner uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and Utopia is here. You may not think it is, but it's a very small island just up there. Yeah? Quite hard to find. So I like this map. It, it, it appeals to my sense of where the world is at. Now, of course, actually, in the world, there, there's a lot of people who don't live in Utopia. Uh, most of us are still living in places like, well, Pandemonium uh, or Fool's Paradise. Um, some of us, if we're very lucky, get to live in places like Reason. Um, and you know, I, I, I tend to spend uh, quite a lot of my life uh, living uh, in, in a place that approaches wisdom, but, but I tend to get kind of wrecked as I go into the shore. But of course, some people say that utopia can be found. And I've got good news for you today, as well as the bad. And the good news is that I think I have found utopia. And unsurprisingly, it turns out to be in Texas. Uh, and there is actually a real utopia in the world, and it's in Texas. And they, this is just tremendous news. And I realize it's tremendous news for us all, because we can make imminent plans to figure out how to move to Utopia, Texas. The bad news about Utopia, Texas, as you can see, is only 241 people get to live there. And that means there's probably quite a lot of competition for the spots. I guess that real estate prices there are pretty high. But I think a more serious point about Utopia, Texas, is that 19.6% of people who live in Utopia, Texas, live below the poverty line. Even in Utopia, things aren't quite as good as they seem. So much for maps. What about thinking about pessimism as an idea? And I think pessimism depends on a couple of things. But one, one, of, it, one of those elements is how we think about the future and how we think about the past. Now, I, I don't mean to kind of come over all gloomy and put up graves, but this is ultimately our final destination. If you have a, a Google map of your life, it's pretty likely to end at death. Uh, we, none of us really like saying that, uh, because we all like to think that if we just change the directions and shake the Garmin in the car, that somehow the destination might change. But I think talking about the past and the future is also important to get a sense of perspective. Um, we forget, I think, very easily that the 20th century was an incredibly violent century. Something like 160 million people were killed through violence in the 20th century. Somewhere between 50 and 100 million people were also killed in the flu pandemic in 1918. Um, the reality of violence and the, and the prospect of a violent death, inflicted sadly usually by our own government or by somebody else's government, was a reality for many people in the 20th century. And there's no reason why it may not be an element of reality for the 21st. 
But there's also an important element about thinking about the future. When we think about the past, we normally can only think back one or two generations. The most immediate historical sense we have is live through our parents and our grandparents. So I, I know what my parents' experiences were growing up in the 1950s. I know that my grandparents, you know, not all of them survived the wars of the 20th century. One of them, one of them was killed in the Second World War. But equally, um, there's, there, it's incumbent on us, I think, to think a little bit more about the past beyond just two generations. But then we come to the future, and the future is even more problematic. We'd all love to know what the future holds, and there's a billion dollar industry trying to predict the future. Governments invest huge amounts of money in it. Hedge funds hire intelligent people with maths PhDs to try and figure out the future. Weather forecasters strive for something that will give us a bit more than two days notice of how the world is going to be. But the reality is, and, and Bill Sheridan, who's a, a, a very entertaining author, wrote a book called The Fortune Sellers a couple of years ago, is that the future business doesn't work. For all the money that we invest in it, our ability to look into the future and properly tell what it's going to be like is extremely limited. And if any of you think otherwise, please do go into the New York or Frankfurt or London or Dubai or Mumbai Financial Center as quickly as possible because you will genuinely become the richest person in the world. And even the people who claim that they can see into the future tend to pick on one prediction that was successful rather than all the other predictions that were uh, unsuccessful. And to support that, I, I have a, a book that I, I quite like. It was published in the year of my birth. It's called the 1973 Book of Predictions. Half of it is written by experts in the field. Everybody from transport planners to technologists uh, to strategists writing about the future. And half of it is written by the kind of people that you or I would have a conversation with on the metro or at a dinner table or in a bar. And the irony about the 1973 Book of Predictions is virtually none of it came true. I'm quite relieved about that because certainly some of the fashion ideas were quite distressing, even from a British perspective. <laughs> but the problem of the uncertainty of the future really does recommend a degree of pessimism in how we approach the world. There's also something that is a reality for us, which is that we are born to be happy little optimists. Yeah. It's not just your parents telling you you're going to be wonderful, you're going to be the best kid on the block, you're going to you know, ace your exams, you're going to be the lawyer, the conductor, the writer. But it's also the fact that built into our human existence is something called optimism bias, which means we tend to overestimate the likelihood of success in the things that we do, and underestimate the likelihood of failure or indeed disaster. And that makes us very dangerous human beings. One of my interests, but I hesitate to say very carefully that I don't do this, is um, wingsuit skydiving. Now these are a group of about two or 3,000 people who put on rubberized wingsuits and jump off cliffs, <laughs> which is one way to get thrill. Um, they do wear parachutes, which is a good news, because uh, and, and there's, there's a fine sign of optimism. If you, if you were truly optimistic, you'd think if humans can now fly, surely they could learn to land. <laughs> but maybe that's just me. But, but wingsuit divers, they're not just content with using wingsuits out of a plane, for example, and going horizontally as far as possible before using their parachute and landing. What, what a number of them like to do, particularly up in, in Trollvegen, which is up in Norway, is, is actually leap off by a cliff and try to keep themselves as, cl as close to the cliff as possible as they go down before then pulling up, pulling their parachute and landing. This is a, an intriguing form of uh, risk evaluation, uh, but very sadly, it's a, it's a particularly unsuccessful one. And up to two dozen people every year die from this hobby. And, and hundreds more are injured every year by you know, smaller accidents as they come down. So optimism bias is something that we have to think about, along with overconfidence. And overconfidence is not just something that afflicts us uh, when we've been educated at a good university or we think uh, we're, we're convinced of our own opinions, even if we're not willing to listen to other people's. Overconfidence is something that happens to us as experts. The more we think we know about something, the more we tend to have faith 
that our knowledge base gives us better judgment than anybody else. And that's simply not true. So optimism bias, along with overconfidence, is hardwired into how we are as human beings, both as young people and as adults. And it's hardwired into our human experience even before you've had all these people piling honors on you and telling you that you're going to be the best person in your society. You're going to be the person who truly makes a difference. So I think one of the key messages, and this is a message from uh, the business world, Charles Roxburgh is, is a management consultant, is that you should try and maintain perspective. You can't necessarily deal with optimism bias in your life. You can't deal with the, the, the real, real sickness that optimism gives us. But you can try to remain dispassionate when you think about the future, when you think about everyday choices, when you think about how to achieve something that you really care about. And you can try to maintain perspective, because perspective helps you maintain judgment. And moving on from perspective, it, perspective helps you with how you look at the world at large. But of course, what we're interested in some of the time is how do we look at ourselves? And here, I think it's very important to turn to philosophers, because philosophers, just like poets, can occasionally be quite useful. And one such philosopher is the South African Jason Van Niekerk, who's written about the transparent reputational economy. And I like that because it's free words, but don't apparently, on first glance, seem to mean anything. <laughs> well, what he's talking about is the virtue of gossip. And I, I think there's a strong argument to rehabilitate gossip, because most of us think that gossip is a bad thing. Gossip is what people do about each other in a negative way. Gossip is poisonous. Gossip is nasty. But Niekerk argues that actually gossip is one of the best forms of knowledge, practical wisdom that we have about ourselves and each other. Why do we like gossiping about each other? Partly it's because we like to be in the know. We like to know something that other people don't. But partly because we like to be able to learn from those life experiences that people talk about. I may be raising gossip to too high a level at this point. But Niekerk has a, an interesting idea. He says, wouldn't it be great if you could tap into that feedback loop about yourself? Because it's only in the school playground that people tell you to your face what they think of you. The rest of their life, they tell you exactly what they think about you, except they don't tell you that. They tell everybody else that. So part of the problems we have is the more important it becomes to understand what our reputation is, how other people view us, how other, how other people view our failures, the ways in which we disappoint other people, the more difficult it becomes to access that information. So to this end, one of the, the big developments has been 360 degree reviewing in the business uh, uh, world. And this began in the 1950s in a, in a small group of companies and has grown to be a very widely used tool where you try and go and ask one person, let's say me, what do I think about myself? And I score myself on lots of different criteria. And you then go off and ask a range of people who work with me, people who work for me, people who I work for, what they think of me. And they score me on the same criteria. And here's an interesting thing. We talked about the optimism bias, but the optimism bias is absolutely evident in 360-degree uh, reviews. Because most people, most of the time, tend to put themselves a little bit above how everybody else puts them. But here is an incredibly valuable tool. We may not be able to reach the perfect, transparent reputational economy, but we can look for practical tools that give us a feedback, that tell us truly how we behave in the workplace, and how we behave in the world. So I really say that one of the tools to be a pessimist is to invite people to be rude about you. And if they don't feel quite confident enough to do that to your face, at the very least, they could do that on an online survey and provide you the data on a regular basis. <laughs> I think the other important thing about pessimism is to have a sense of humor. And the foundation of satire is disappointed idealism. I think it's tempting to think that pessimists Pessimists are people who've never had any dreams. They just want to break ours. But what happens if pessimists are actually the real dreamers? But they're the dreamers who recognize that the world can't always be shaped by our dreams. And that actually dreams also can be quite dangerous. People, are too passionate, people who are too passionate about ideas can be very lacking in value 
for people's lives, the effects that those ideas can have on lives. So I think having a sense of humor is a really important part of um, a pessimistic approach to life. Now, you have to balance that. I would suggest that somebody I know who introduces his, his wife, and he says, this is Penny, she's my first wife, might not have quite worked out the balance <laughs> between having a sense of humor and having a marriage that has recently concluded. <laughs> um, you don't have to be cruel to pursue a sense of humor in, in pessimism. Uh, a very cruel example is, is a, a, British, a very famous British actor who basically wrote his autobiography uh, in which there's a picture in the middle of it of a slightly windswept looking person. He doesn't mention her anywhere in the book, but he just says, Sarah, full stop, we were married for a while. So you don't have to be cruel. You don't have to subscribe to the kind of uh, misogyny or misanthropy, which has often been associated with pessimism. But I think you do have to have a sense that just because things aren't going to turn out well doesn't mean you can't have a laugh about it. So to conclude, the vision I want to give you is neither Apple nor the apocalypse. We're not likely to live in a world where iPhones and iPads shape our lives into a perfect world of Apple oneness. We probably won't live in a world where we have an app for everything, even though I know there are people hard at work in California right now trying to make sure that we do. But nor are we going to live in a world where we're going to be stalked by the apocalypse day to day, at least not anytime soon. We know that we can't all live in Utopia, Texas, because there simply isn't space. But I think we can live with a new secret friend. And that secret friend can be pessimism. Thank you. <laughs>